Okay, it's a uh, recording. Uh, welcome, Khan. Please, uh, Daniel, can you introduce Khan to everybody? Yep. Okay, thanks, Khan, again, uh, for um, accepting to give this talk. Uh, Khan is a security researcher. Um, who is uh, interested in uh, kernel internals, I think especially in Windows kernel internals. Mm -hmm. And he will talk us today about the um, uh, speculative discovery of um, instruction set architecture secrets of x86. Um, thanks for um, coming to this uh, joint uh, Talks, tech talks of Eclipsium and uh, uh, UNC and FAMAF. My thanks for, for having the chance to present to a nice crowd. So let's start. Uh, who am I? First of all, I do independent security research, uh, some kernel driver development on my free time. That usually isn't a normal kernel driver. I most of the time ignore MSDM portability recommendations and like focus on the architecture because it's very interesting in system development, writing a scheduler, memory manager, etc. And I also do a lot of the obfuscation and the virtualization research, static analysis, etc. So that's my background. So why did I start this project? So I woke up in the 20th of March and saw this tweet from Mark. Apparently, he found two instructions in the microcode of Intel processors that can write and read from the control bus. But um, they are apparently decoded, and then they throw you D. So uh, despite analyzing the picture to hell, I could not figure out the second byte of the opcode which then made me think about SenseLifter. There was a previous project that also aimed to discover undocumented instructions. And yet it was missed in the SenseLifter, which made me wonder why. And that is due to the detail UD. So if you think about how SenseLifter works, it first of all measures the instruction length using the page faults. There is no trust involved there, which is good. But the second measurement it does comes from the execution. So he tests every instruction, and then once the length is appropriate, it executes it. And then if it throws UD, he assumes this instruction doesn't exist. But this is technically a really like wrong assumption. For instance, assume you set CR4 that OX FX SR to zero, right? then SSE instructions will UD as well. Do they not exist? Are they not decoded? Yes, they are. Or for instance, if you access a certain MSR with the lockbit set, you get a GP, which would be the same result as accessing an MSR that did not exist. So trusting the processor exceptions in this case is a wrong idea. So what we should be doing is a single point measurement in the decoder itself, the DSP, the mite, and MS. But how do we measure this unit? And that is where the PMU comes to the game. Uh, there's three performance event selectors, MSU ops, mite U ops, and DSP U ops that are very much of interest to us. So what we can do is configure the PMU to measure these events. And then we trash the DSB to disable the iCache to get proper recording of the data. We execute. And then we do RDPMC again to read the counter measured. We save the data and then repeat this experiment a few times, right? There's still a problem, though. He was doing this test in ring 3. I mean, referring to SenseFair. The problem is we have to be in ring zero because we have to change the MSRs in a fast amount of time at least. So how do we execute in ring zero without side effects? Comes to the mind. 
Speculative execution. So this is what we do. This is the basic code that we test on. So it starts with a call. Call to a label X. And then this label X wastes some cycles. For instance, there's a V new oops, and then add PS. This is a AVX to SSC switch, which will cause a stall. There's reads, there's like square root calculations, which is super slow. And then at the end of the snippet, there's a exchange racks, which is like I chose exchange because it will cause a memory stall again due to the lock implied. So this part's whole job is to stall the execution queue. And then at the end of it, it skips execution and continues. So the other stub does not get executed at all. But the second stub will give it a chance to be like speculatively executed since the processor assumes the call will return at some point and will still queue speculative execution at the site. So the, there's a three by tail I put after the instruction which is because we measure another thing, uh, FPU div active. Now you might think, what is the use of this measurement? But um, it is useful because if you put it at the end and then put the instruction beforehand, you can see if the instruction is a serializing or speculatively pens, essentially. So what do we try here? Um, since we're not certain of the instruction's length, so as we don't use page fault, and we can try every other combination, we pick a methodology that essentially uses what the Intel instructions use, right? The suffix is always 90, which is nop, or if the instruction is a mod rm or sib, it also decodes as a valid suffix. The byte before that is anything, so we try every single byte here. The one before that is again, anything except the prefixes, since a 66 here won't be much of use. This one is 0F or omitted, since 0F is a common thing Intel uses to make set like two byte opcodes. And finally, 66, 9B, F2, and F3 which is because Intel uses these to make four bytes and three bytes of codes, essentially. So we're left with 600K instructions possible, and all of this test completes in two seconds as opposed to a day in sensitive. Now we have a lot of results, but since we don't know the instruction length or anything about their details, we have to reduce the results since some of them are redundant. Uh, what we can do is that we know a byte to be actually UD. Let's take CE, right? If you have another measurement, let's say 0F3B here, if the bytes decoded, I mean, uh, operations be decoded via the mite and the MS are the same, like in comparison to this CE byte we have, then it's a UD because it didn't decode anything specific and it didn't execute the knobs. So you can remove them. If the MS stays the same and might is different by one, exactly one, then the prefix or the suffix is considered redundant. Since the amount of UOPS decoded by the MS is the same, the might is the same, and there's the only difference of a 90 there, which is overridden by the suffix or the prefix we had, but since nop is exactly one uop decoded by a mite, this means they were actually the same thing. So you can remove those two as well. If mite is the same as the baseline faulting case, for instance, CE as the original baseline we have, it means the instruction is serializing since the instructions after that the knobs we filled did not execute or even decode. So we learn another property about the instruction. And finally, the measurement I mentioned earlier, the DevSS. If the FPU div active counter has the same results as the UD case, 
the instruction is split on the fence. Because if the instruction decoded properly and continued the execution of like speculative queue, we should see some divisions going on. And if we don't, then this means it's a speculation fence. And finally, we have the results of this experiment. We did find the opcodes we wanted to find. It seems to be 0f, 0e, and 0f, 0f. And many others. Although I for, unfortunately I couldn't test all of them myself since they really knew the I don't have a read unlock CPU. And certain bugs in Z, for instance, Z tells me that prefetch VT1 is not recognized in my CPU, except it does the code and run. And there were some surprises contradicting popular belief. For instance, on the right you can see a patch to Linux in 2016, where they introduced move to CR3 as an architecturally spec like serializing instruction as an alternative to CPU ID, except this isn't true anymore, apparently, as the rights to CR2 are not serializing. And there were some interesting surprises. For instance, this one, comparing ICPP, the originally undocumented one byte int one versus a normal int. Um, the only difference we thought they had was that ISPP wouldn't check for privileges, right? But it is quite interesting that uh, it actually has more logic in the microcode, like 20 or so opcodes, likely hardware debug related. Move SS and the pop SS we talked about last year um, causing like interesting behavior. Apparently also applies to LSS, for instance. It, LSS EDX is a speculative fence. It is serializing. And there are some interesting instructions you wouldn't expect to be serializing. For instance, LGS. There is no reason for LGS to be serializing, and yet it is. There was another result that prompted me into making a bit more research, though, which was RDMSR. If you think about it, there are a lot of LSRs that should be handling tons of logic, and yet the instruction handling all of them seems to be very short. It's 82 opcodes. So how come is this possible? Turns out read MSR and write MSR instructions are special cases where they jump to a specific part in the microcode depending on the ECX you pass and then queue further opcodes in the instruction queue. So why is this interesting, you might ask. And it is interesting because it means we can use the same code we discovered instructions with to discover MSRs as well, which I discovered yesterday, by the way. Uh, it turns out MSRs in the group 0xc, blah, blah, and 0x0 are fundamentally different from each other. So we should discuss them separately. So the group 0xc seems to be mostly mapping one-to-one -to, -one to the MSR space. Most of the values actually dispatch the same microcode instruction that probably checks the MSR space for the existence of the register and reads or writes depending on the access rights of this MSR. Um, there were a certain amount of number of MSR numbers that were like specially optimized. This is FMask, TSC AUX, L star, C star, GS space, FS space, FR, and so on. So basically the ones that would make sense to be optimized since they're so like used so often in syscalls and like GS reads, etc. And that's because they're kept in the MSR space. Um, they're not kept in the MSR space, but the register file rather. And there also seems to be a limit to the amount of MSRs in this range, since after 0x FFF, it doesn't decode anything and just straight up GPs. Now the rest of the MSRs, the ones that do not start with 0x C, seems to dispatch special logic depending on the number of the MSR. And they're like clearly distinguishable when they will GP. So this range, 
we can actually discover secret MSRs here. For instance, the list on the right is listed from like the highest amount of UOPs to the lowest in terms of right MSR. And then in the sixth entry, you see two E6. It has a bit of an old MSR. I tried writing to it, it GP'd. I tried reading to it and then it GP'd. So after posting this on Twitter and looking at Google, I found one mention of it after which to Mark Ermalov, who also found the original URH debug instructions, replied to me saying that this is the MSR that controls the accessibility of those instructions. Quite wild. There are certain MSRs that are super optimized. For instance, the list you can see on the right, TSC deadline and X2 APIC registers mostly. They're actually requiring even less UOPs than a normal GP because they were at the bottom of the list. I was quite surprised. There is approximately 500 valid MSRs in this range of 0 to 0x1000. Zero uh, zero, zero, zero. And I did not get the chance to test every MSR yet since this finding was done yesterday. But I found one interesting MSR, which was 0x3F0 in my Broadwell E machine, which was a rather innocent MSR returning whether the CPU is CPU zero or not. But stuff like this makes Intel architecture really complicated because even if you, like, let's say you have the goal of making a virtualization sandbox, right? Now this 0x3F register will make your VM detected because in a VM, I could just switch to the first core, read this continuously. If it doesn't return one always, and tada, you're under a VM. Stuff like this makes the Intel architecture really interesting. And I bet we will see more interesting things coming up sooner or later. So it was a bit short. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, we can go back to the slides and I can explain them better. Okay, Dan. It was a slap in the face. Uh, <laughs> but let's let's rewind <laughs> and sure. try to, to to understand. Uh, I I I I've got uh, I've got many things, but but a lot of a lot missing. Uh, uh, it was it was like 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 Andres said, like a bucket of of cold water. It's it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. But uh, first, for example. Uh, MSRs are, are, are a special registers, and what you said yes. in the last in the last thing is is very important. Uh, checking if you are in a virtual machine or not is is is, yeah. is important for security reasons. Uh, it's it's not uh, really uh, something to, like, to 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 forget. Uh, but yeah. what else did did you find in the in the in the in the search for new instructions and, and new space and, and exploring? Uh, all the space. I mean, like like a simple example for the for the audience to understand which is the the, the implications of, of mm -hmm. finding and the con and and documented uh, regions in the in the instruction set space. Uh, the thing is, I could mostly like discover the existence of the U code, right, rather than being able to try them myself. And since I don't have a red unlocked CPU like Mark, I couldn't like test most of them since they just set up UD. But most of the time, the interesting parts were the interesting like properties of the instructions, like such as the LGS one I mentioned, or the move to CR2 that even the Linux kernel did not expect. Most of them it was stuff like this. But like all of these properties make virtualization of this architecture extremely hard, since even the documentation doesn't help you, which is fifteen thousand pages. So yeah, that was pretty much it. They go on money. About, uh, uh, yeah, I am still processing. <laughs> uh, so, um, did you try? Uh, so, MSRs, uh, writing to MSRs, uh, trigger more logic and more micro codes upon uh, the in the decoding phase. Um, mm -hmm. Mm 
Can you say if uh, the expansion of new uh, microcode, uh, sorry, microops, uh, could be dynamic based on the uh, state of the processor or it's always expanded into the same amount of uh, microops? Uh, um, I think it always expands to the same amount of microps, but there is probably like depending on the MSR number, right? There's a check if you should be able to access it. For instance, if you go back here, uh, you see the zero x two e six, right? And this is the mm -hmm. MSR controlling the UH debug instructions. But once it's written on boot time, you can't access this anymore. But regardless of that, I was able to see it being an outlier here. So I think they decode to the same amount, but depending on the like secrecy of this MSR, it checks for access and then throws GP. And how would, would you explain that it uh, GPs? Why would that be? Since if I understand properly, it's uh, enabling or disabling uh, the GABAG uh, capabilities, right? Yes. Why would it uh, GP? Uh, because they want this to be only for Intel developers. So most of the time in the boot time, there is like an initial code, initial piece of code running that, you know, the OS can touch, which starts with disabling this from the start. It writes zero. For example, if you see there was a core boot example that wrote to this instruct, I mean, MSR, Right, and that was the only mention. I also found another mention in NDA documents, but again, it didn't have a name. It was just writing MSR, zero, that's it. So the boot time starts with this MSR being locked from the user, so you can change it. Sorry, you said core boot? Yes, core, core boot. boot, it is written, this MSR? Yes, there's a write and MSR 2E6, zero, at the beginning of the core boot like TSX initialization, which there's no explanation, there's no columns, there's no name, it just writes zero. And is that part of the general uh, boot uh, processing sequence or it's conditionally uh, in some uh, uh, debug uh, uh, compilation mode? Uh, no, I think it's a part of the general initialization. If there is, there's the Intel code for this, which checks if the CPU is TSX capable, and then it checks if the chipset is TSX capable, and then it writes zero in the beginning of the initialization of the memory and so on. So it seems to be quite like locked away from the users. There is a question in the chat or a couple of questions uh, let me see for the uninitiated what are the implications of the properties observed um i would say that most of the properties you can't really test as a user but there are some interesting ones such as making virtualization very complicated at least proper and complete virtualization and some others such as like intel documents not being fully accurate which, for instance, you can refer to the CR2 case. Everyone thought it was serializing. The documents say rights to control registers are serializing, and yet they aren't, which is quite weird. But you learn more from testing stuff like this rather than looking at the documents, sadly. Yeah, another potential uh, usage of this could be a malware dissection and malware uh, behavior and understanding, especially if you can enable certain uh, debug instructions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Did did you find holes in in security? Uh, trying to trying to find instructions in your instructions? Um, I basically tried every single like undocumented opcode that decoded in kernel mode, but I was very unlucky. None of them mm -hmm. actually executed, sadly. So it seems to be quite protected from the user. You would likely need a hardware debugger and like the red unlock mode if possible to try any of them. Okay. There is, is another. 
Yeah, is it necessary any kind of privileges to execute this instruction or is it possible to execute them um, as a regular? As far as I know, from like Mark Ermov told us, the, um, these can be executed in user mode as well, but if they're unlocked. Mm. Marcos, are you with us? Yes. Did we succeed to read MSRs in user space? I don't think so, right? Yeah, but, but he's mentioning that the, 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 uh, the instructions are being decoded, not necessarily executed. And uh, no, yeah. I recall reading MSRs. Uh, so, by the way, I wanted to ask a question. <laughs> a very nice talk. By, yeah, thanks. Um, so I assume that maybe you have a list of interesting opcodes and interesting uh, MSRs. Oh, yes, 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 definitely. Uh, you can find all of the instruction data here. Let me send a link in the chat real quick. There's this, you can go to and like see all the instructions and okay. the properties, there's tables. The MSR thing, I actually discovered yesterday, like I said. Oh. So <laughs> I will be making data public, hopefully this week, but we'll see. I barely had the time to put it on the presentation and slept, basically. Nice, it's, it's fresh. <laughs> there are it's two questions. Yeah, there, there are two questions, uh, Can One is from Karen. Uh, she okay. says that, that if, if dog mismatch uh, smells like bad faith, uh, how were these results received? I mean, what, what did they, what did Intel said about that? Um, Intel serialization properties, as far as they're concerned, the documentation says that write to a control register, no matter what register it is, mm -hmm. is serializing. Mm -hmm. Except you find out quirks like this where mm -hmm writes to CR2 isn't serializing and the document mm -hmm. is telling you that it is. Okay. Do you think that, that it's a query? It's, it's a, it's a, I it's don't error? think it's bad. I don't think it's an error or like Intel doing this in bad faith, right? Mm -hmm. But they probably introduced an optimization since there is no mm -hmm. point in making CR2 actually serializing. It would be quite worthless. So they probably optimize it away and forgot to update the documents rather than lying to us or something for that theory. So, so we can speculate that there is a program trying to run on your hardware that it's not serializing the access to CR2 that will work mm -hmm. in the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, it could be. For instance, the Linux patch I mentioned earlier, if that was still the same code, you would, you could probably like, occur some random errors once in a while because they thought it was serializing, but it wasn't. Have you received any report of, of that kind of, 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 of misbehavior because of very specific models and optimizations in the microarchitecture? Um, no, I haven't. And I think Linux changed the code in the end. This was like five years ago. So I think that also is gone already. Okay. Okay, I have more questions, but but go and then. Well, before I ask myself, uh, there is another question. Can this method be applied to other architectures like ARM or Apples to dig into them too? Well, Apples uh, we distinguish to between. Be, uh, to be yeah. honest, I'm not super familiar with ARM. Even applying to this, applying this to AMD, I had a hard time because the performance counters you need for this method to work are quite specific. I couldn't find most of them in AMD. Funny enough, AMD has a lot of undocumented performance counters, so they probably have this counter I want, but it's not documented, so sadly, I did not have the chance to apply it to AMD even. Uh, that was my next question about the PMU. Um, what, uh, what performance counters did you use? How did you prevent uh, context switching from making noise? Uh, I was in the current mode already, right? So it was pretty much the matter of disabling interrupts. I also did a paranoid check for SMIs where I read the SMI counter, did the experiment, and then if the counter did not match, I just repeated. Just, just to be paranoid enough to make sure it was not interrupted. <laughs> SMI means, uh, for, the, for the record, um, uh, system-managed uh, interrupts. 
are the interrupts that are usually executed in the BIOS, in the system firmware uh, uh, code. Okay, um, and what uh, performance counters did you use? Um, let's see, going back, there was three, like I said, that's like the directly measuring the decoder. Let's go back. Sorry to ask So there's, you this, there's these three, which are like one of them measures the amount of UOPS that was decoded from the MS. MS standing for the microcode sequencer, which is responsible for decoding complex instructions, right? The other was MITE UOPS. This is used for like simple instructions that decode to less than four opcodes. For instance, NOP, like I used later on. And there's DSB. The SP I measured just to make sure there was no errors, since if the step two here, which is like effectively writing over iCache, if that worked out fine, the SP should be reading zero. And it was reading zero, but I measured it anyways just to be sure this was an effective way to do it. And the fourth PMU unit I used was FPU directive, and this was, like I said earlier, it was because like I wanted to measure and see if I can speculatively execute the instructions found. I was mainly curious because there was like some speculative leaks early on, like a few years ago, if you remember. For instance, you could set up GS and then read GS space to leak kernel GS space in user mode. So I wanted to see if I can use these instructions that were reading the control register bus in user mode, for instance, and then I, if I can leak data from them, but sadly they did have a speculative barrier in the Europe, so I could not. And retarded, uh, retarded um, I don't remember the name of the counter, but uh, retarded, don't you need to take into account also the retarded uh, microbes? Uh, yes, I do, which is why I calculate a baseline first, right? The 0xCE, which is fault, like it's UD, so it will fault directly, which will basically be accounting for the rest of this snippet, apart from the snippet we insert, right? Like if the execution stalls, one second, here, then the numbers we have will all come from this place, if that makes sense. So if you do another measurement after inserting a byte in the padding and then subtract the baseline, you can find out the amount of difference inflicted by the change of the bytes in the pad, if that makes sense. Did you try with uh, more, um, uh, with heavier instructions such as those from uh, AESNI, uh, AES and instruction set? Um, I think I skip a portion of VEX, which is like responsible for AVX additions, AVX2, etc. That is mainly because I wanted to reduce the clutter, but uh, they should work fine. I don't think there would be any problem with finding them out as well. Uh, one question from, from Alejandro. He, he, he's asking if, if machine learning could could help to explore the space with uh, with less effort. Let's see. Um, well, you could use the ML to like distinguish the results, you're right. But we sadly like don't have enough information about the results themselves to speculate on like what kind of opcode it could be. So like, I don't think an ML would help you a lot here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Although, although I have mm -hmm. to mention, if you read other PMU counters, such as like the amount of opcodes dispatched to port one, two, three, four, five for each mm -hmm. instruction, then you could see the similarities between other instructions that you know to decode. So that could be quite interesting, actually. Okay, and, and one question I had. For example, with the, with with that not serializing instruction that, that mm -hmm. should be serializing, mm -hmm. uh, you know if it, if it's possible to 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 give a, a microcode patch uh, from Intel, I, I I don't I never understood how much you can patch from the, from the from Intel microcode patches. I think yes, you can definitely patch it out, and mm -hmm. 
I'm speculating, obviously, but I'm pretty sure they can patch everything because most of the logic comes from the decoder, right? And then this decoder decodes into the microcode MS ROM, which is loaded in the CPU that you can change. So you can make any opcode do pretty much anything. I actually think there was a paper from a researcher I sadly don't remember where they were able to get uh, writes to MS ROM in a very old Intel model, Intel model, and they changed, for instance, the behavior of CPU ID selection and so on. So, like, I definitely think it's possible to do what you asked. Okay, okay. Uh, do you have any any pointer for for the for the for the people? We're curious about knowing how 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 the the Intel and AMD and, and modern processor work in terms of microarchitecture. Perhaps this this talk is a is a is a kickstart for for them to to start learning what what happens inside. Um, I would definitely recommend reading through the Intel documents responsible for systems development. So like. Mm -hmm developing an OS and so on. This section of the document is incredibly detailed. And although, like I said, some of the stuff I'm missing, while you're reading, you actually learn about the CPU internals. For instance, the PMU documents, which is a part of this document I'm talking about, talks a lot about like the decoder and like what happens if there's a loop, which is like decoded via LST, for instance. You wouldn't know about any of these if you didn't read that specific section because they're not actually mentioned mm -hmm. in the documentation of the architecture. But while you're like reading through the OS development and the extensions in the CPU, you learn a lot about the CPU itself. Perfect. There is another question. How do you decipher what newly found up codes are doing without proper documentation? I sadly don't. I wish I could. <laughs> if you could get your hands on a CPU with the red unlock state, you could probably find a few other instructions since they would execute fine and then speculate their behavior from there, but I sadly do not have one. One thing I, I, I didn't get, Khan, if if you if you had a chance to to uncover new and documented instructions that are quite useful in a sense, mm -hmm. did you? Uh, did I what? If, if you if you if you found new instructions that that are useful, yeah. If I found any, um, no, I haven't because pretty much all of them UD right. And I don't know what execution state I would need to be in for them to actually execute. And I did not have a lot of like uh, free time in my hand, but quickly trying all of them in kernel mode resulted in a lot of UDs. So sadly, I did not get anything useful out of it. Yeah. Okay. And and uh, um, Danny, do you have more? Uh, yes, actually, uh, one technical and not that technical. Starting the non that technical is um, what's next? What are your uh, next plans regarding this or in general from this uh, uh, research? Well, having found the MSR detail yesterday, um, I plan to actually look into the, the instruction that was reading from Sierra Bus. If you remember this instruction, let's go there real quick. There is this 0F, 0F, and 0F, 0E, right? And one of them reads from the debug state, and one of them writes to it. So like, if I could extract information from read MSR without executing them, given the list of MSRs I found, without even like doing read MSR at all, I was speculating maybe I could try the same technique on the U debug read and see if I can explore the Sierra space, if that makes sense. See. Is there any other 
uh, besides MSRs and, uh, and instructions, uh, do you foresee any way to discover new registers, for example, like there are big things like, I don't know, CR3, for example, or things like mm -hmm. that very well documented, but what about uh, the discovery of other registers, uh, for example? Any chance to do that? Do you foresee any technique to, um, to, to, to do that? I'm not sure if there is a lot of space to be found like in another register because mainly due to the like how instructions are encoded, right? There's a specific amount of bits you have in the encoding of an instruction to encode the register target or source. But this space mm -hmm. is already exhausted by the registers we have since they're like 16 registers, which equals to three bits. So I don't think you could just find out and register. And if they did, I don't think they would be hiding it from us since it would be useful, right? Okay. Yeah, to discover new upcodes, the uh, the signature, let's say, or the ID is one of the first uh, uh, questions <laughs> the, to, yeah. to know the structure of the of the of the, of the instruction. Mm. Okay. Uh, any other question? All right. Uh, well, thanks a lot. This has been amazing. Thanks for sharing this with us. Thanks a um, lot for the chance to share it with you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> thanks a lot because it was it was a talk that 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 shocked us, and <laughs> that, that that is good because because it moves you <laughs> to, to 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 say, hey, I know nothing, <laughs> and that, and that is always good. Well, I hope I could replace your morning coffee with a bucket of cold water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we we can follow what, what you are what you are actually researching in the in the social network. So so yeah. we can we can see your progress in, in a sense. Yeah, and especially it lasted what thirty mi uh, thirty minutes, thirty five minutes. It. I love it. It, yeah, it was it's... like a slap in the face. I love it. Yes, it was. It's, it's a new kind of talk. I will, I will call it the the can way of talk. I hope it was nice. too fast. No, no, no. It, it was. It, it was nice. Thank you. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you, okay. Uh, thank thanks you. everybody else for attending. Yeah, thanks everyone yeah. for for being here. And uh, well, uh, th there will be more talks, so so stay tuned. We we are communicating through the usual channels. So, so thank you very much. Bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Goodbye. Bye.